Our newborn babies begin life with a slate clean of knowledge and experience. In the first few months, they are learning which of their muscles move which parts of their own bodies, and they quickly begin to smile. Within a couple of years, they have turned themselves into walking, talking persons. Throughout the first years and decades, children learn the meaning of facial expressions, behavior for each of numerous social situations, and how to be a valued and contributing member of society. Children have a strong urge to mimic everything they see their parents do and will learn the details of their culture with such fierce conviction that it cannot be later unlearned or too greatly changed. For example, would you consider using anything other than a wedding ring during your ceremony? Throughout the remainder of our lives, the only culture that makes any sense to us is the one in which we grew. This innate conviction to mimic may be involved in our feelings that any cultural detail that is different than what we have learned is not right, and it may be the reason that we might go so far as to insult the outsider but it is also as refreshing as another universe to experience other cultures. Each of our 10,000 cultures are stranger than fiction, including our own. A newborn child could be taken from any place in the world and plopped into the middle of another of the world's 10,000 cultures. That child would learn the ways of that single culture, feel right at home, and think that the other cultures of the world are strange, including the culture of its birthplace. If a newborn could be transported from 20,000 years ago and placed in your home to be raised with your family, he or she would learn your ways just as do your own children. Since each of us has the same genetic heritage, about the only way we differ is that some of us prefer potatoes while others prefer yams. 30-year-old parents may believe that a sudden change in culture is strange but their infant children will always believe that it is normal. Culture does change through the generations. There are noticeable changes every 100 miles or kilometers and every 100 years. The culture of your grandparents' youth was different from that of your own. It is also true that people rarely make sudden and drastic changes in their culture unless forced to do so by an external cause. For example, the invasion of a migrating people who are settling into your homeland. Keep in mind that those of us humans who continue to live as gatherer hunters today do so simply because they have never yet been forced by climate, neighbors, or invaders to change their well-working system. When farming was first invented about 10,000 years ago, the entire world did not instantly decide to abandon their gather-hunter ways that have worked for as long as anyone could imagine. Even if a group of gather-hunters lived right next to a group of farmers, they still preferred to keep their old way of life. It took several thousand years for our farming ways to spread throughout the planet, typically spreading by just 10 miles or 16 kilometers per generation. In the same way, about 250 years ago, when parts of the world first began to industrialize, people saw no reason to abandon their farming ways that had worked for as long as anyone could remember. After 250 years, our industrial ways have spread to just a portion of the planet. Our more elaborate culture is one way in which we humans differ from the other primates. A group's culture consists of their instructions on how to do everything in life including greetings, birthdays, weddings, funerals, ceremonies, and making and using tools. We have an innate predisposition to learn culture, but the culture that is learned is limited only by the imagination and humanity of its makers. If you ask how a shirt should be folded the night before a wedding, someone will figure out an answer that will then be repeated for centuries. If you ask the member of a culture why they throw rice at a wedding, they will answer, 
because that's the way it has always been done. The cultural details of a group seem random to an outsider but require no explanation to a member of that culture. This is true of the details of your culture too. Your child learns thousands of such details in just a few years, which makes learning the 10 numerals, the 26 letters of the alphabet, and the handful of scientific principles seem trivial in comparison. Such a volume of knowledge simultaneously requires and takes advantage of a big brain. The initiations and funerals that we are viewing show that every group of us humans include much singing and dancing in most every ceremony. It's just the details of the ceremonies that differ between cultures. Most of the details of your own custom surprise the people of other cultures because they do not do these things. Seeing the world from another's viewpoint lets us see the strangeness of our own ways. We then appreciate our own culture more and have an increased tolerance for others. Experiencing another culture expands our mind. How are we all the same? We share humanness. Ask any person anywhere on the planet what matters most in life and they will answer healthy and happy children, families, and communities. Most every thought and action involves love and family or community and justice because we are parenting mammals and social primates. We simply want to laugh and joke with our spouse, family, friends, and neighbors, pursue life, and raise children. We all agree about the proper behavior between family, friends, and neighbors within our social community. That's to do as the other did and to expect the other to do what you did. An errant member can be punished by unpopularity, being ignored and left out, or by simply applying the cold shoulder. These small pressures are very effective because a human can hardly live without social interactions. When a person breaks a major rule, they might be expelled. Throughout the last few million years, expulsion was a life-threatening form of punishment because every group member knew that a person will not survive alone in the wild for long. Since we know that we need each other, the health of the community is of utmost importance. A newborn infant from any place on the planet and throughout the last 50,000 years is equally likely to have a level of talent that is among the highest of all of us. The talent of one in ten of us for playing the piano or for performing complex mathematics rates among the top 10% of that of all the humans in the world. One in 100 of us have a talent that rates among the upper 1% of us. Since we're all human, this is true of every group of humans who have ever lived at any time or in any place including those of us who live in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, the islands, or the Americas. It doesn't matter if this person is currently living in a culture of gather hunters, subsistence farmers, or factory workers. Even a person born 50,000 years ago, if somehow transported to today, is just as likely as anyone else to become a fine surgeon, engineer, or composer. Those of us humans who are born in a slum of one of today's big cities have these same talents. Our goal is to arrange the society that is our mutual effort such that no one is restrained from reaching and contributing his or her full talents. Otherwise, our mutual society will not be all that it can be. Our biological ancestors accumulated culture through a few million years. Whenever unequipped for the task at hand, we naturally look around for something to fashion into a tool. We create a tool for every need, and each newly invented tool means that our way of life changes a little. Our first tools were sticks and stones, as they are for many species. Later on, we modified rocks to cut, poke, and scrape. The knowledge and use of each newly invented tool quickly spreads around the planet everyone else experiencing the need for that solution. Since the time of the first humans, all of the humans of the earth have been combining knowledge. 
Today's science and technology is the combined sum of all the facts, tools, and procedures ever discovered or invented by anyone throughout the planet. Your everyday life is filled with things you have inherited from the many peoples of the earth, as explained in Ralph Letton's essay about the diffusion of inventions that I will now recite. He describes the origins of many elements of daily life for a man who lives in the United States. Our solid American citizen awakens in a bed built on a pattern that originated in the Near East but was modified in Northern Europe before it was transmitted to America. He throws back covers made from cotton, domesticated in India, or linen, domesticated in the Near East, or wool from sheep, also domesticated in the Near East, or silk, the use of which was discovered in China. All of these materials have been spun and woven by a process invented in the Near East. He slips into his moccasins, invented by the Indians of the eastern woodlands, and goes into the bathroom, whose fixtures are a mixture of European and American Indian inventions, both of recent date. He takes off his pajamas, a garment invented in India, and washes with soap invented by the ancient Gauls. He then shaves a masochistic rite that seems to have been derived from either summer or ancient Egypt. Returning to the bedroom, he removes his clothes from a chair of southern European type and proceeds to dress. He puts on garments whose form originally derived from the skin clothing of the nomads of the Asiatic steppes, puts on shoes from skins tanned by a process invented in ancient Egypt and cut to a pattern derived from the classical civilizations of the Mediterranean and ties around his neck a strip of brightly colored cloth that is a vestigial survival of the shoulder shawls worn by 17th century Croatians. Before going out for breakfast, he glances through the window, made of glass invented in Egypt, and if it is raining, puts on overshoes made of rubber discovered by the Central American Indians, and takes an umbrella invented in southeastern Asia. Upon his head he puts a hat made of felt, a material invented in the Asiatic steppes. On his way to breakfast he stops to buy a paper, paying for it with coins, an ancient Lydian invention. At the restaurant a whole new series of borrowed elements confronts him. His plate is made of a form of pottery invented in China. His knife is of steel, an alloy first made in southern India. His fork a medieval Italian invention, and his spoon, a derivative of a Roman original. He begins breakfast with an orange from the Mediterranean, a cantaloupe from Persia, or perhaps a piece of African watermelon. With this he has coffee, an Abyssinian plant with cream and sugar. Both the domestication of cows and the idea of milking them originated in the Near East, while sugar was first made in India. After his fruit and coffee, he goes on to waffles, which are cakes made by a Scandinavian technique from wheat domesticated in Asia Minor. Over these, he pours maple syrup, invented by the Indians of the eastern woodlands. As a side dish, he may have the egg of a species of bird domesticated in Indochina, or thin strips of the flesh of an animal domesticated in eastern Asia that had been salted and smoked by a process developed in northern Europe. When our friend has finished eating, he settles back to smoke, an American Indian habit consuming a plant domesticated in Brazil in either a pipe derived from the Indians of Virginia or a cigarette derived from Mexico. If he is hardy enough, he may even attempt a cigar transmitted to us from the Antilles by way of Spain. While smoking, he reads the news of the day, imprinted in characters invented by the ancient Semites upon a material invented in China by a process invented in Germany. As he absorbs the accounts of foreign troubles, he will, if he is a good conservative citizen, thank a Hebrew deity in an Indo-European language that he is 100% American. We are all in this together. We all contribute to the progress of our civilization. 
which future tool will be next to significantly alter our lives? Will it be genetic engineering, fusion power, quark-based machinery, a colonization of other planets, or something as unimaginable as were electronic computers 150 years ago when Maxwell first finalized the equations describing electricity? Those of us humans who are Canela live in northeastern Brazil at the edge of the Amazonian rainforest. We will have a somewhat detailed look at the Canela way of life in order to illustrate the depth, range, and richness of human culture around the world. Knowing something about gather hunter ways also helps us better understand the magnitude of our subsequent shifts to full-time farming and then the factory work, using the only three styles by which we have lived. Anthropologists lived among the canela, asked them to explain every detail of their ways and responses to social situations. In the same way, anthropologists have recorded the culture of hundreds of groups of people. During the 1970s, the canela lived in a few villages, each having a few hundred residents. From the air, we see huts along the outside edge of a circular area, area in a Kurikuro village. This is the Escalvado village. We see paths connecting each home to the center. The circle is about 300 meters, or yards, wide. Its central 50 meters are used for socializing and for ceremonies. Here is a view from the ground. The circular layout is of the utmost importance. Following the canela sense of symmetry, the homes of certain pairs of persons are placed on opposite sides of the circle. Generations names bounce around the village in ideal patterns that differ for females and males. A village is located on level ground of hard clay to accommodate dancing and is placed within 1,000 meters or yards of the water supply. Crops and wood are obtained for 10 years from the surrounding area and will travel to them as farther than 12 kilometers or 8 miles and then the village is moved. Stone axes and fire are used to clear trees. After the village has been away from an area for 10 or 20 years, its trees and fertility of the ground will have returned so the village may return to the former location. The canela plant numerous water-holding purity plants in the nearby valley floors so that water will be available even if a drought occurs. They stock waters with fish. Just as you and every other human being, canela parents live for their children, make toys for them, and help raise the children of others. The canela are together and see another every moment of their lives. Each person knows the personalities of 50 others well enough to predict the behavior under various circumstances. They know each other through their lives, from infancy through the learning years of childhood, then parenthood, old age, and death when they're aged in their 70s. Such an age is nothing new. Imagine living with the same group of persons your entire life. That is what our ancestors have been doing for millions of years. We can expect that every village has jokesters, storytellers, gymnasts, slow movers, pleasant, unpleasant, grumpy, and happy smiling people. The photos were taken in the 1930s and 1970s and show a steadily continuing way of life. Through previous centuries, the canela gathered seasonal fruits, nuts, roots, and berries from the region, traveling as much as a three-day walk, which is 60 miles or 100 kilometers. A small portion of the food was attained by farming corn, yam, milk, maniac, squash, pumpkin, melons, and peanuts in gardens placed at the edge of a stream. The canela also fish and hunt. As described earlier, hunting is actually the harvesting of an area's animals and is done by finding exploitable behaviors in the animals. A talent for hunting is much appreciated. One uncle explained his disapproval for his niece. You want to marry him? What sort of game has he ever shot? Gather hunters prefer to live near a variety of food sources, such as occurs when living in a forest or near a lake near mountains. Fruit ripen on mountains weeks later than at lower elevations and makes fruit available through more of the year. Today, the canela are restricted to 10% of their previous food collecting area, and so they've had to switch to being farmers. They now obtain just one quarter of their food from gathering and hunting. The modern world has expanded to their doorstep, bringing new tools, clothes, indoor plumbing, and a money-based exchange system that is suddenly changing the canela way of life that has worked for countless generations. 
They are beginning to raise chickens and pigs to sell to fellow Brazilians and are also employed by the Brazilian government. Notice that the canela are as happy as anyone on the planet. Happiness is, is obtained mostly from family, friends, and social life, whether we live as gather hunters, substance farmers, or big city factory workers. Our happiness is not determined by the number and type of tools we have, Gather hunters' homes typically contain a few baskets and clay pots and a bed. A tree stump might be used for a chair. There are no curtains, carpets, dishes, or silverware. As civilization encroaches, a family might add one small mirror to their home. Beds are made out of beauty leaf stalks placed on a forked tree stump. During the day, beds are used as chairs and dining tables. At night, a bed might hold one person or a whole family, but many prefer to sleep outside. These tools are sitting on top of a beauty mat. Similar mats are used as sleeping blankets, but people's feet are left uncovered and warmed by a fire kept near the bed. Cord is made by combining twisted beauty strips into thicker strands and ropes. For tens of thousands of years until just last century, every person knew how to make a basket and would simply make another whenever the old one wore out. Throughout the planet, we humans have made mud and grass or wattle and daub homes. Trenches are dug, upright poles are placed in them, and then the trench is refilled. Horizontal poles are attached to the vertical poles, and then walls and a roof are attached. Canal men build the homes that are then owned by the women. A house typically lasts for several years before showing wear. An indoor fireplace is used for boiling. Roasting is done with an outdoor earthen oven. Fire is preferably replenished from a neighbor's fire. Otherwise, it is created by holding a stick against a block and then rapidly turning the stick between one's palms. Women gather most of the firewood as small sticks and leave their men to carry the occasional large piece. Daily activities in the courtyard always include dancing and singing from 3 a.m. to 6.30 a.m., and then again in the afternoon. There are morning and afternoon men's councils, and there is a daily work, siesta, swimming and bathing, football, and log racing. Women nurture children, farm, and collect firewood and water. Every morning, men work together to repair roads, maintain village boundaries, harvest rice, or to help on someone's farm. All peoples in the world agreed that proper behavior is to do as the other does. Each culture differs only in the details. Proper behavior for Canela includes being open, not being egotistical or arrogant, sharing freely, being generous, not stingy, not being mean or angry, not talking bad of others or verbally abusing a person to decrease his or her self-image, avoiding actions that might start rumors, maintaining peace and harmony, and striving for the approval of others, especially those of your own age group. The Canela say that shame keeps a person from acting contrary to tradition. The Canela do not want to be shamed or to lose face by lying or stealing and believe it is evil to seek revenge against another member of the group. Do you agree that these are proper behaviors? The Canela value peacemaking and problem solving within the group, but sometimes conduct seasonal battles of revenge against neighboring groups. Rather than self-gratification, Canela individuals live more for the good of society through the available social activities. Canela maintain peace and harmony through singing, sports, dancing, constant joking, and sharing of the fun of the moment. They walk away from confrontation, refrain from extremes of behavior, and avoid public displays of affection. Jealousy or anger are soon forgotten because the opponents will be singing and dancing together every day. Older generations have much influence over the younger ones, and each person strives for the approval of his or her own age group. Canela adhere to tradition and believe that performing a task in a unique manner is considered egotistical and evil because it might unravel society. People obey family heads, elders, group leaders, and the chief. To feel that he or she has supported the group, a person will not perform a duty until the proper leader orders it to be done. 
Those having a talent for buffoonery join the clown society, who behave in a slightly incorrect way to emphasize the proper way, as in this crooked house that they built. Unresolved arguments are settled through meetings of elders, trials between families, and interventions by ceremonial chiefs. Aggression is not permitted. Boys are not allowed to fight, nor are larger boys allowed to bully smaller boys. If a fight results in a broken bone, damaged eye, or the loss of blood, then a penalty is imposed on the man causing the damage, and his entire family will be shamed. The anthropologist Crocker did not see a serious fight in 20 years. In fact, parents do not strike their children except as punishment for repeating the most extreme behavior. They are then struck on the palm. At least 124 years has elapsed since a murder occurred in the region. A canella is firstly a member of their nuclear and of their maternally extended family. A brother-sister bond compromises with the most serious interpersonal loyalty. During one ceremony, sisters hold their younger brothers to protect them from the mystical soul snatchers. Uncles particularly help nephews and aunts particularly help nieces and one's extended family assists whenever the need arises. For example, when short on food or during a squabble with others. When threatened, a person might point out the offender that he or she has many relatives. We saw earlier that primate societies consist of cooperating extended families. Uncles sponsor the ear piercing ritual for their nephews and they teach new fins during the Pepe festival. This challenging ritual matures a young man and builds self-control. The young men are secluded for days in a room within their own house and rarely talk with anyone except for their uncles who lecture them on traditions. Throughout this time, the youths must never walk in the yard lit by sunlight or moonlight unless they cover themselves in mats or cloth. They must not step on dead twigs or dead leaves, and they must not eat meat or drink certain vegetable juices. Why do you suppose they can all do these things? They will answer because it has always been so. The Canella firmly believe that a young man becomes an adult only by following these procedures, and they firmly believe that by breaking these rules causes a youth to become a poor hunter, to be unable to withstand the midday sun, and that he will not be able to speak with ghosts as would be required for him to be a shaman. Aunts and uncles have special roles in naming, kidding, loving, socializing, disciplining, and advising their nieces and nephews. The Pepe Festival is concluded with the year's participants out in the courtyard. The Canela conduct numerous festivals, ceremonies, and rituals throughout the year. A specific extended family has the right to arrange a given ritual, but if they fail, they have let down the entire village, and the council elders will give the rights for that ritual to another extended family. Since it honors the entire extended family, they provide food for a village-wide ceremony whenever a family member is selected to be a singing and dancing leader, a town crier, or a ceremonial chief. These are the corn planting, protecting, and harvesting ceremonies. They are led by a man whose maternal home must be located on the east side of the village circle. In the planting ceremony, he places a painted gourd bowl filled with maize kernels in the center of a plaza, and then people dance around it. After these seeds are planted in his wife's field, the other families begin planting their own fields. When the maize has grown to a height of one meter or a yard, a ceremony is held to induce the moon to keep parasites away from the crop. Everyone claps and sings their proper phrases and then dances from the north to the south across the plaza at a night under the full moon. A portion of each year's crops is stored away for seeding for the next year's crops. To keep insects away from those seeds, they are stored in a tightly corded jar that is sealed with wax and hung from the indoor smoke-filled rafters. Each of the world's farming cultures conduct ceremonies to accompany the planting, protecting, and harvesting of crops. We humans naturally accumulate ceremonies because they combine our cultural and social natures. Ceremonies bind together the people of a culture, as does, for example, Independence Day, and ceremonies of the utmost importance. Ceremonies consist of detailed actions and statements that are very meaningful to the practitioners. Canela husbands clear plots of land for crops and then both spouses do the planting. Wives own the field and that it is reserved for their use until the shrubs have grown too tall because they have stopped using it. 
Women do most of the weeding and all of the picking, in which the day's food is taken directly from the vine. People having food share with those who do not. Many steps are needed to process bitter monoic into edible flour. It is peeled, grated, strained, pressed into mats to remove acids, and then toasted into flour called freinha. The canela used plant materials, bark, branches, and leaves to make a great variety of items, including headbands, girdles, wristlets, sashes, fire fins, baskets, combs, carved club handles, and other items. Through the last 100,000 years of Gather Hunter society, each person makes his or her own clothes, baskets, tools, and decorations from the raw materials readily available in the surroundings. These items are not purchased from someone else. Either the extended family or the entire community combines efforts to construct homes and do any chores that are larger than can be accomplished by one person. All of the Gather Hunter peoples of the world have egalitarian societies devoid of rich and poor. Each individual's efforts directly feeds and provides for his or her own family and group. Put yourself in the place of a problem-solving gatherer hunter who needs to fashion a tool from available plants and animals. Most of us city folk don't know much about plants and animal materials, but we are familiar with the many materials of a car. Can you make 100 tools and decorations from car components? For example, blankets from upholstery, jewelry from the shiny pieces, poles from headlights, and hammers from metal pieces. If you melt together the wire coverings, hoses, foam cushions, and the headliner, does that mix turn into some sort of glue? If you had your entire lifetime to find uses for car parts, what portion of the car would you find to be most usable? After a community of 50 persons worked with this through 10 generations, would they be able to use every part of the car? How many parts does a water buffalo have? We will always be amazed by the process of birth. For the canella, childbirth occurs indoors with the help of an elderly maternal relative who ties the umbilical cord with cotton, cuts it with an iron knife, paints the cord with red akuru juice, and places a kara bark juice on the cut. The child's mouth is cleaned and the mother is taken outside and washed, but she is not to be painted. The afterbirth is buried inside the corner of the house and the mats on which the mother has lain while birthing are taken by her mother and jammed into the fork of a nearby tree where they are left to be consumed by the next wildfire. As she puts the mats on the tree, she asks the son to keep the baby from harm. A canal mother rarely lets go of her new child for the first few months of life. The father waits outside during the delivery because men must not see a birth. After the pregnancy, his wife lies on her side while he sits on her hip to push back together her pelvic bones. During the pregnancy, he prepared the birthing mats and placed other mats around the bed to create a seclusion space in which the couple will remain, except for bathroom breaks, with their newborn separated from everyone else until one month after the child's navel string falls off. Until it falls, the mother wears a red ukuru painted purity belt. The navel string is saved and will be given to the child when he or she reaches the age of four. The child places it in the hole of a sukupriya tree and then grows to be as strong as that tree. During the pregnancy, both parents do things they believe to ensure the health of the child. During seclusion, the parents are not to paint or decorate themselves, cut their hair, eat any of several specific types of meat, or scratch themselves with their fingers. Instead, they use small sticks. When eating sweet potatoes, they must save the skins in a basket that is carried behind the house. They must not gnaw on like bones or the child's umbilical cord might rupture. They must not eat parrots, doves, armadillos, or saramas. The mother must not eat the honey of a tuba bee unless it's mixed with manioc flour. Otherwise, she might have a miscarriage. They must not kill a snake if they encounter one. The father must avoid singing a paco or he might cause a miscarriage. Do you suppose these sad coincidences occurred in the past and caused the origin of these taboos? By the way, a woman might induce an abortion by eating a certain plant if the father abandons her during pregnancy. 
many of a child's problems are fully believed to be caused by things that the parents have or have not eaten, and the corrective dietary steps are taken. Why do you suppose that the Canela do these things? They will answer, because it has always been so, and to do otherwise risks everything. Cultural details vary, but people do not. A Canela mother's primary goal is to take care of her children, feed them, socialize them, and keep them happy. We can be sure that a Canela parent often tells the spouse, well, it's you she takes after. We humans have a tendency to attribute events and misfortunes to food recently eaten or actions recently taken. This results in taboos concerning things that one can or cannot do or eat at certain times. Taboos are unique to each culture. The origin of such cultural detail might happen in the following way. Suppose a groom fell out of his hammock the night before his wedding, and then one week later he found out that his new mother-in-law was a nag. This might influence others being in sleeping on the ground the night before their weddings in order to avoid a similar fate. If one recently married man breaks his favorite bow, then it might be blamed on a sneeze during the wedding ceremony. If a sneeze or cough occurs during the wedding ceremony in your culture, what does it mean for the future of the newlyweds? Our animal brains have accumulated the ability to relate cause and effect, but we are not always right. You might have noticed a coincidence between two events in your life. How many such events do you think you could recognize during your entire life, and how many cultural details could be produced at this rate by a group of 100 persons throughout a 1,000 year period? Each human is especially susceptible to disease during its first year of life. For this reason, the people of most every culture have a seclusion period in which the newborn and the mother grow visibly stronger while separated by a wall away from the rest of the world. We can imagine that this technique was discovered by one determined mother who kept her child away from the rest of the village. The care and nurturing of our children is of utmost importance to us. In fact, we can gauge the success of our society and of our entire civilization in terms of the percentage of our babies who survive infancy due to our combined efforts. So a mother can naturally concentrate on one child at a time, she is biologically less likely to conceive again while breastfeeding. For the canella, breastfeeding lasts two to four years. Throughout these years, a child is continually held at the breast. The home contains families of all the daughters of an elder woman. The children of the household are taken care of by the women of the household. Any woman might nurse any child while its mother leaves to collect food and firewood and such. If a mother becomes pregnant while still nursing a child, she weans immediately because the canella believe that the fetus needs the milk. Canella life is practically stress-free in this way if life begins at once. If a child misbehaves, it is distracted into another activity rather than being corrected, punished, or commended. A child is weaned by using solid food to distract it away from the breast. Infants aged 11 to 15 months are stood to encourage walking. They are also encouraged to dance and shake rattles. Children learn to talk by listening to their parents and imitating them. Every culture recognizes puberty to be one of life's major steps and believes that both seminal and menstrual fluids are special. Blood from within our bodies is usually seen only in the most dramatic of life's events. When the biological reasons for menstrual fluid are not fully understood by a culture or a group of persons, then this event is often considered to be among the most amazing of phenomenon. In most of the world's cultures, adolescents are secluded from the rest of society for several days or weeks, during which they are given lessons and must have made food taboos. The seclusion period of time is a transition from which an adult emerges. Life distinctly changes as adolescents leave behind carefree play. Most every culture celebrates this transition with some sort of ceremony. The canal believe that marriage builds relationships between extended families. About 5% of boys and one quarter of girls marry between the ages of 10 and 14. By age 29, 90% of males are married, while 90% of women marry before the age of 20. Offspring usually do not occur until a young woman reaches her late teens. For humans, the biological chances of conceiving are very low until later teens, highest during the mid-twenties and impossible after menopause. After marriage, the groom moves into his wife's house that also holds the family of his sisters. 
The sisters of the house are related by blood and so dominate daily happenings while newly arrived husbands have a small influence. In this matrinal residence, wives are safe from a tyrannous husband and husbands organized against tent and pecking. He helps feed his new household. The marriage becomes a complete relationship when children are born and then it lasts until at least the youngest offspring is in mid-adolescence. Couples who grow old together are role models. The eldest men and women are esteemed. They are not addressed by their name, but are always called grandfather or grandmother. Young people show respect by giving way and by waiting to speak. Nobody ridicules an old person's fertility. We all know that death is a part of life. A canela person will die surrounded by family and friends in their mother's house. A widow will not cut her hair, put on makeup, or wear decorations. She speaks only with the members of her own house, remains in bed, and laments daily for the loss of her husband. Men running a log race will drop the log mid-step to join the cries of others who are lamenting a lost one. The dying person lies on mats in the middle of the house, feet towards the door, while the next of kin gather around. A female relative says a few words at the moment of death, then relatives sit next to the deceased and lament the loss. The body of the deceased is prepared by cutting the hair, plucking the eyebrows, smoothing the features, and putting on decorations. If the deceased is a child, then he or she will lie in the lap of each of the nearest relatives who will cry. The room fills with blubbering and people saying, when you were still alive, I was very fond of you. The deceased is wrapped in the match on which he or she has been lying. The mats are then tied around them and suspended from two poles to carry the deceased to a cemetery. No belongings are placed in the grave. If the deceased is a woman, then on top of her grave are placed objects such as her carrying basket and a gourd bowl. The canal believe that if the deceased is not eaten during his or her last days, then the shadow of the deceased will go once more to their mother's house for food. A meat pie and a gourd of water are placed behind the mother's house. An old man watches the pie until he hears a rustling of its leaves and then announces he has eaten. The counselors will then take the pie to the plaza where they will eat it. The Canela believe that every living creature, maybe a plant too, has a shadow or a soul, but the soul plays no part during life. At death, the soul leaves the body and with the other souls continues a life comprised of the same daily routines as before death. About all that is different is that they don't eat and they rarely speak, producing only the occasional shouts heard in the distance. The souls of deceased relatives gather around a dying person and sometimes convince him or her to adopt their ways, which is why a dying person has stopped eating or speaking. The souls accompany the dead person to the cemetery and after burial, lead the deceased soul away. The soul of a deceased maternal uncle usually accompanies the soul of a deceased infant. We can imagine the grieving Canela saying, Uncle Kip is leading her away now. Along the way, the soul must cross a river by walking over a thin, swaying tree. If the soul slips off, then it will become an aquatic animal. Souls of the deceased help their living relatives by appearing in their dreams to warn of danger and by clearing poisonous snakes from their path. They sometimes appear for an instant during the day. A shaman is neither a witch nor a priest. When a person is ill, a shaman is sought to effect a cure by removing or driving away the infecting spirit or entity. This nearly always works. The secret of much of the curing power of a shaman is our own immune system, which enables us to recover from all but the worst illnesses without any medical intervention. In most of today's visits to the doctor, medical assistance serves only to shorten the duration of an illness that our immune system would have cured on its own. Shaman exists in all gather hunter and farming cultures. Shaman try to remove the cause of any other misfortune. The casual spirit might appear in bits of material in the hand or mouth of the shaman. Shamans are not charlatans, but practitioners of procedure that they believe to work. Shamans perform these procedures on patients, not fools. Shamans fully believe that they can communicate with the spirit world heal sick people, and even end recent misfortune. Shamans often go into the excited state sometimes, influenced by drumming or even hallucinogens. 
The shaman goes about daily life with the rest of the community, but assists others when they are in need. As a result, they are among the most respected members in the community. In most societies, shaman teach their techniques to young people who have shown promise or interest. In Kanela society, shamans are believed to be able to see and communicate with the souls of the dead. Kanela shaman typically have specific powers, such as the ability to cure chest pain or find lost objects. When sought for cure, Kanela shaman use their mounds to suck disease out of the patient's body, rub charcoal on the body of the patient, blow them over with tobacco, or use their hands to remove sickness that is then thrown into the wind. A shaman is not a priest. Priests lead the traditionally set ceremonies of a world religion comprised of members who sit and watch. A shaman is not a witch. Witches try to cause a misfortune through witchcraft. Until a century ago, gossip of witchcraft comprised much of the daily conversation throughout the entire planet. Witchcraft is assumed to have occurred if misfortune singles out one person, though others should have been affected. For example, if just one person becomes ill after eating a communal pie, then witchcraft is suspected. Or if several persons walk along a river, but only one falls in and becomes sick, then people might assume that witchcraft has occurred. Myths explain the origin of each element of daily life, including ceremonies, procedures, recipes, the origin of maize and it, the knowledge of its use, baskets, fishing with nets, poisons and arrows, house building, meat pies, and the origin of the Canela people. The knowledge of the techniques, tools, ceremonies, and procedures forming the Canela way of life are passed down to each new generation. We do not only teach our children how to plant a specific crop, but we also explain its origin, how we came to know of it, and how to cook it. Where it gets its mysterious power that enables it to grow out of the ground. Miss explain the origins and sacred nature of the ways of the people and answer the questions, where did this come from and what is its source of power? The Canela origin myth explains that the sun used to put into the motion the tools that would clear the trees to make a garden plot. But interference from the moon stopped the motion of these tools, so now the people have to do it. At first, the Canela were the only people on Earth, but they did not know how to use collectible or cultivative plant foods and did not know how to make a bow or arrow or how to use fire. They simply wandered the forest eating rotten wood and sun-dried meat. One day, one person was held captive by a fire-using jaguar but escaped and took fire coals to their people and have used them ever since. Later, Star Woman came down from the sky and taught the Canela how to prepare fruits and vegetables. She then took a Canela man back to the sky with her to be her husband. The Canela described the time of day in the terms of the sun. They say that each night the sun travels under the earth to return to its rising position. This is true and makes sense, but is not fully accurate. By the way, how do we know that it is the same sun that returns each day? Whenever the moon is darkened by an eclipse, the canela shoot fire-carrying arrows towards it, and without fail, they always rekindle the light of the moon. Everyone likes to hear stories of their group's past. We all ask, how did we get here? Each group of persons has developed mythological explanations for the origin of the peoples and their rituals, foods, tools, institutions, ways, and procedures. Myths also justify existing society by prior procedures. Each myth explains how a specific reality came into being. Myths are taken as given truths handed down through countless generations and are as sacred to its people as Bible, Quran, are to Taoists, Confucianists, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Hindus. Each person would feel much distress they would feel their own world was ending if any part of the sacred trusts or, mythologi or mythologies were called into question. Religion forms a large part of what makes us human. We each experience awe in pondering these parts of the world that seem larger than human existence, including such things such as weather, the starry sky, thunder, the sun, the processes of birth, and the relations between the plants and the animals of the earth. 
Religion is universal because all humans share the same feelings, emotions, needs, desires, appetites, satisfactions, and mental states. Our religions are those aspects of our culture that are our answers to questions involving the most awe-inspiring elements in our lives and surroundings. Each of us human beings knows that we are born, live, and die, and are subject to death, famine, disease, and malice. Many of us believe that we share this world with invisible, superhuman spiritual beings. Religion's most important function is to explain the cause and effect relationships between these beings and the humans and to explain natural phenomena, illness, and the mysterious things that seem to be not of this world or seem to be inexplainable in ordinary terms. It satisfies the human desire for food, rain, gathering hunting successes, and provides comforting explanations the form of religious expression is seen to be as diverse as the number of peoples. This is important. It is the reason that all persons should take the religion of others to be a serious and sacred part of life. No group should view another group as toy people. Our biological ancestry includes parenting mammals and social primates. The amount of cultural detail in a group of humans is much greater than in chimpanzees. We have been accumulating culture through a few million years, but especially through the last 100,000 years. Whenever unequipped for a task at hand, we naturally look around for something to fashion into a tool. We create a tool for every need, and each newly invented tool means that our way of life changes a little. Our culture is passed down through the generations and is modified through time. Our culture consists of a recipes for how to do everything in life and it comprises thousands of details, as we see occurs in the Canela culture. The peoples of the world share humanness and agree that the most important concerns in life are love and family, community, and justice. The people of all cultures agree that life's most important steps include birth, puberty, marriage, and death. Humans of the past, present, and future are most awed and concerned about these things, and each culture has very different ways of celebrating these milestones. We show fascinating differences in our cultural details. There have been about 10,000 different cultures around the world through time, and each is equally strange and unbelievable. The people of some cultures knock on wood, throw salt over their shoulder, are careful not to walk on sidewalk cracks, and cringe for their future when they see black cats walking under 13 ladders. Why do you suppose they do these things? Their answer will be, because it has always been so. Seeing ourselves from the eyes of an outsider gives us greater appreciation of our own ways and for the ways of other peoples. This increases our tolerance for others. We gain respect for every culture of us humans and see that the other groups do not contain toy people, but thinking, feeling individuals who are really just like us and that they share the same desires and concerns and complications in their social lives. When we better understand the ways of others, we better understand the uniqueness and arbitrariness of our own ways. We can then begin to see our own culture from the eyes of an outsider and gain more respect for ourselves and for all other humans. It has been said that the best hope for humanity is a belief in humanity along with trust, mutual respect, concern for one another's well-being, and a belief in the fundamental good of each person. Occasionally, those of us who are big city wage earners have trouble seeing those of us who are either gather hunters or substance farmers as inferior people because they are living a supposedly backwards way of life. Remember that those of us humans who are living as gather hunters today do simply because they have never been forced by climate or outsiders to change the way of life that has worked for thousands of years. You might like to carefully compare your largest concerns and goals in life and your most cherished aspects of life with those of the Kanawa. How do you compare our own with their levels of social and economic equality? The health and well-being of the members of society, equal access to all of the benefits of a group membership, their sense of belonging to the community, the level of their satisfaction with being a member of a mutual beneficial community, the feelings of control held over one's own life, and continued welfare. This will help us gauge the level of our success through recent centuries and together improving the lives and possibilities of all of us. 
As you ponder the differences and similarities between yourself and the members of another culture, such as that of the Kanoa, you are pondering what it is to be human. There has been little biological change in humans in the last 20,000 years. We have invented all of today's technological civilizations using nothing but our animal minds. A person from 20,000 years ago would be just as adept at engineering and sculpture as a person born anywhere on the planet today. Today we have daily interactions with persons from all continents. 500 years ago, when the Europeans and the Indians of the American continents first encountered each other, there was no understanding of the other's culture. This lack of understanding allowed many atrocities to occur. Five centuries later, there is still too little understanding between these groups of people. An increased tolerance and understanding of the culture of other humans of this world is important. It may even reduce the possibility of war. If you want to travel back 20,000 years in time and talk to your ancestors to find out their views of the world, all you have to do is speak with your children. Ask your child if rocks, trees, cars, and shovels are alive. Does the wind make the trees move, or is it the trees that make the wind move? What is the sun, the moon, and those little stars we see at night? Every child knows that the sun and moon follow them around. When they walk clear down the street, they can look up again, and it is still right there with them. Ask them about the powers within these things that make them work. Our Homo sapiens species is about 200,000 years old, and by 20,000 years ago, our cultural adaptions enabled us to spread throughout the planet. All of us human beings share the same nature. We are thinking and feeling creatures. Nature made us human and able to develop culture, but the details of culture are invented by us, and invent we do. We have these big brains and use them to invent cultural details by the thousands. Some of us today might mistakenly imagine gatherer hunters to be cartoon-like cave people who sat around on logs all day in an ignorant stupor, but in fact there are no simple people. Even our remote human ancestors had lives filled with thousands of cultural details. The language and grammar of each gatherer hunter people is as complex as your own. We human beings are a bunch of genetic clones who share identical limbs, livers, emotions, feelings, and needs. We have a range in personalities. The example of the culture of the Canela shows us that humanity consists of thousands of cultural groups full of fascinating differences in the details of daily life. Each culture is like another universe, far more intricate and fascinating than the people of even a fictional novel. How do we differ from one another? The details of our culture differ for every group of people. How are we all the same? We live for our children. Each of us simply wants to laugh and joke with our family, friends, and community members. Whenever a human being is thinking, talking, or doing, that activity involves love and family or community and justice. That is all there is to any human being anywhere on the planet and throughout the last million years or so. You have the same emotions and needs as does every other person on the planet who is alive today or has been alive in the last million years. You love and nurture for the same reasons today as did your remote ancestors, and for the same reasons as does a Canela person and every other person on the planet. As Johnston describes, your emotions are like little packets that have traveled through time, connecting you with your remote, parenting mammal and social primate ancestors who lived long ago on the African plains. Your emotions in nature also connect you with every other person on the planet today. And in fact, you share parenting and social emotions with many of the world's creatures. Our children are born with the slate clean of knowledge and experience and quickly acquire the culture in which they grow. If your own newborn baby and that of a Canela family were switched at birth, each would learn the culture of their adopted home and think that the other's culture was strange.